Hey everyone, Matt from soundrolling.com. Thank you for joining me for Sound Chat 40 uh, in 2016 and Happy New Year to everyone as well. So I'm here with Nathan Ashton. Hello, Nathan. Hello, sir. Thank you for having me. Thank you for joining me as well. Um, and so uh, Nathan is all about post production, uh, dialogue editing, re recording, mixing, uh, even Foley sound editing. Um, so it's going to be a really fun uh, kind of jam-packed talk about all things kind of post-production. Um, so to kind of uh, kick things off, I guess we'll uh, just go into kind of what your what type of projects you're working on at the moment. Okay, um, up on screen I have a comedy that I'm working on. I have another two weeks of editorial, um, dialogue cleaning, um, ambiences. Uh, sound effects. Then we'll bring Gal in for a second round of Foley, and we're waiting on music. And this one has been one of those back burner projects that uh, the budget isn't great, and so it keeps getting rolled back. But I, I just need to beat the music guy, you know. Right. <laughs> I never want to be the last person to cross the finish line. So if I'm ahead of music, then uh, then we're we're good. Uh, last night, I got a call back from a California project, um, and so I was up really late doing additional Foley work on an HBO documentary, um, all by my lonesome, but mm -hmm. I have an iPad app, so I can sit in the Foley room and queue up tracks and do my oh, thing. Oh, fantastic. It's a little slow. Actually, it's a lot slower, because I rely on my Foley mixer to tell me when something works. Right, right. And they'll hear things like the stool I'm sitting on creaking that I don't hear because I'm so myopically focused on on the sound. So that's that's why things take longer when you're by yourself. But that was last night. Um, most of the work I get to do is is in the family friendly arena. That's been the circles that I've plugged into. And so it's nice. Work from home. Nice. I'm in my, in my basement studio right now, and uh, just that direction is the Foley room. Amazing. And, uh, that direction is uh, my wife. <laughs> so, <laughs> that direction and up the stairs and around the corner, but that's another nice thing. So. Nice, nice. And how long have you uh, been kind of based in the studio that you're in right now? Um, five years. Fantastic. Roughly. Aggressively it's, for the last three. I had another place I was working a lot out of up until then. Ah, fantastic. And, and what made you kind of uh, just decide to move it at home, apart from having the, the space, obviously? Yeah, part of it was I finished out the Foley room. Right. That was a big part of it. The other part of it was my partner moved. Ah, okay. And so it just dried up and blew away basically overnight. And then I had to scramble because... He was bringing in a huge chunk of the projects, and and he was handling the business side. So I had to suddenly form my own business and uh, right. retread the network tires. And, ah, yes, <laughs> it's never ending, is it? <laughs> no, that's fantastic. It's really interesting. Just like I really wish that I had more space to be able to kind of build a studio, but being in a flat in London ah. on the second floor, you can't really start knocking down no. walls and <laughs> invading no. other people's space. Um, but that's that's really cool. And so with your um, like Foley room, are you what are you doing for like footsteps? Are you having like do you have like slabs of uh, material that you then put down, or do you have things like built into the floor? Yes, and yes. Oh right. But the put me in the basement because it's on a concrete slab. Right. So I don't have the echo problems. I can do sidewalks, just smack mm. on the concrete. And then I do have a large area that has dirt that moves on towards um, gravel. Then I do have oh. a proper rock section, and then I can lay on top of that um, a wood kind of planking. I have something else that sounds more hollow, like a, a canoe that I can right. put down. Um, then I have a pit that's just all sorts of crap. Amazing. 
<laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's really cool. And, and how did you go about kind of uh, researching like the the I, I guess like finding finding the right things as because I mean I've I've always wondered how people just decide to like like what's the is there like a right type of gravel if you see what I mean is there like movie gravel and is there uh, like movie dirt or there's movie or, dirt oh okay nice. yes it's decomposed um how do you say it vermiculite it's granite pulverized granite right um, okay because real dirt actually you can't go to the store and buy sand that sounds horrible i tried it okay <laughs> It just it cuts your feet up if you're walking barefoot. Um, it's just nasty stuff. Real dirt is second best. It compacts and sounds right, scuffs right under the foot, but it does get really com compact after you stomp on it for a while, like a forest right. path. And then it just doesn't do much sound-wise either. Right. So if you mix okay. in this, this decomposed granite, then it keeps just a little bit of fluff in the in the dirt it doesn't mold as quickly uh so there is that amazing I haven't found movie rocks yet movie rocks yeah, yeah that no, that... part of a union and that, that might be my problem yeah well it's it's really interesting just yeah about all the different surfaces and and do you I, is there any kind of like maintenance i guess are you like do you have to do a bit of like gardening in your, in your foley studio to like keep keep things <laughs> keep things ticking over um I did learn not to leave the dirt covered up by the the um, floor surface, the wooden surface, for too long. I had a long spell in between projects, Foley projects, of like two and a half months. And I went in and I opened it up the day we, we were going to be starting work. And um, it was just white, fuzzy stuff was growing on it about oh. any inch. Thing. It was it was truly a remarkable science experiment, but um, <laughs> yeah, we had to get rid of it all and get new get new stuff in, and that was not fun. <laughs> and so, what did you kind of uh, start off with? Because I you you kind of have many hats in post production, um, and and so was it? What was your kind of route in? Whew. I'll try to give you the medium length story because the long one is really long. Um, I got into sound because I couldn't afford to get into animation. Ah, in the 90s, interesting. it was too expensive. Um, but there had been this turning point in audio technology where you could actually get eight tracks on your computer, which was a huge deal. And I thought, this will be my back door into animation. I'll get, I'll start to work on the soundtrack. I'll record audio dramas and all this stuff. And someday my dream will happen and I'll do animation. But then I kind of fell in love. Um, it's just fun. I did do a, a, a side trip into music. My wife writes music for television and film. Um, so she's, she's all about music. But I discovered that, well, there's a quintessential day when right. I was interviewing a guy and he comes into my studio. I was in Oklahoma at the time and this guy had had a mullet all the way down all his, on his shoulders and he talked like a surfer dude. So he walks in and says, dude, I'm going to record like my first album. So, gr great, you're, you're 50, why now? Because I got me a good guitar. I'm thinking, you know, some sort of really nice handmade something. So I said, well, what kind of guitar? Dude, man, it's red. I ain't never had me a red guitar before. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I don't care. You know, that's... That's the, the song of someone who is in the wrong business because I didn't care. It, it, I didn't care enough to figure out what this guy had to offer that was different from the last guy. Right. What, what's going to make him special? What's, I just want to plug his guitar in and push record and get paid. And I discovered that when I'm doing like 
sound effect editing. I'll be yeah. doing fisticuffs. And I have a huge library of, of punches and crunches and stuff. So it's the same thing over and over and over, just like electric guitar is the same thing over and over and over. But somehow this matters each time I sit down to do it. it, it there's a reason to do it. And that um, epiphany is that made me realize that not all money is good money. And doing the music stuff was really distracting me from something that I wish I could do more of. Um, and from there, it was just a matter of layering skill on skill. My, my network is into low budget projects. So they're hiring a guy or a couple guys instead of a fleet of guys. And that means I get to do a lot of things. And if I can't do it, then I either figure it out or I hire somebody else. And there we are. Yeah, fantastic. It's kind of, yeah, it's always interesting meeting people that don't come from a, a kind of direct music background. Because I, I came uh, from, I guess, making uh, just like stupid videos. And then it came time to choose something to do in university because I didn't want to get a job. I thought like three years of university, yeah, that's, that's probably pretty cool. Um, and then chose film as well, just because it would be easy, it's something to do. I kind of had a little bit of like um, trying to do bits of animation here and there. I was, I was just trying everything that was kind of in a, uh, a film, uh, I guess, uh, theme. Um, and then from there, realized very, very quickly that all the other people that were there obviously were uh, directors, cinematographers, all that kind of stuff. And I didn't really have a, a title, as it were. I just kind of turned up and I was just like, I'm just interested in this. And everyone else was like super hardcore, like, oh, have you seen um, X, Y, and Z? And I think my, like, <laughs> I, I hadn't seen, God, I'd only seen, uh, I hadn't seen all these, like, uh, I guess like cult B movies, the from whenever, <laughs> and all these directors that I'd like never heard of, and I was like, well, I mean, like, yes, that's like Star Wars was good, and um, but even Aladdin was pretty funny. Like, I liked Robin Williams, and everyone else is just like, what? Like, how can you be a serious filmmaker? Blah blah blah. Um, and so I, I eventually like found um, my niche again, doing sound. And again, it was just really interesting um, just having, well, firstly, it, it then offered me the chance to do lots and lots and lots and lots of projects, right? Because there's only like two sound people um, on the course in my year. So I got to do the, the people in the years above. And I came out of uni with like 30 projects just because no one else was, Wonder. no one else wanted to do yeah. sound. People were like, yeah, you have to, like, you're the, um, <laughs> the worst kid in gym class, so I'll pick you for my sound <laughs> and blah blah blah. So, um, but then then I I transitioned more from so there's two of us, and I was more into doing kind of post production, and uh, but I because uh, there wasn't the other guy was like really wanted to be a location sound guy, so I was like, well, okay, then I guess that makes sense that I should default to do the post production because then you have a team. Yada yada yada, um, but it was uh, it was then that I kind of fell out of uh, I guess post production because I just ended up fixing people's mistakes, and so that yes, was sir. the big turning point to to then getting into location sound, and then the the turnover of projects was faster, and I could try and figure things out, and now I've come back full circle. And now I'm trying to do both the location stuff and then follow it all the way through right. to do post-production because then I know what I've recorded, I know the story, I know where all the files are. And so I'm trying to straddle the best of both worlds, um, again, in kind of the uh, just the low-budget realm, um, but also the, the corporate realm of, of different projects that are coming up now. Everything is online or um, this, that, and the other. So, so yeah, so it's interesting.
Do, okay. do you have any experience of like uh, location sound recording, or have you already or, uh, very, always done very little? Um, by the time I really got into narrative work and film work, I already had a family. Right, right. And location is a young man's gig. At least that's what I tell myself. Um, <laughs> but people who do it well, they're my heroes. And I will speak at any film festival that will uh, invite me and give me housing during the festival because low budget filmmakers don't really understand what they don't understand when it comes to sound. And so I, ha I do the shtick of the 12 different parts of, the, of sound in your film. Right, okay. That usually is enough for people to say, hey, I just thought it was a microphone, you know? Right, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so starting with story, getting to editorial, give, give space in your film for sound to happen. Um, to spotting, to ADR, to loop group, um, the difference between sound effects and Foley, uh, music, re-recording, e I missed a couple in there somewhere, but it's, it's more than half the movie. Uh, I, if you poll people why they go to a movie theater, only 5% will say they go because they want big sound. About 30% will say they go because they want a big picture. 50% say they go because they want a social experience. All right. Um, and, and, and another 5% go for the popcorn. So <laughs> as many people go to a movie for popcorn as for what you and I spend our lives doing, um, that's, it could be depressing if you <laughs> Unless but you like popcorn. <laughs> But if there's something wrong with a picture, people are, are almost three times more likely to complain if there's a problem with sound as opposed to a problem with picture. Right. And you can look on YouTube and you'll sit through something that's grainy and ugly if it sounds good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It sounds bad, you bounce. There's other things to watch. Yeah. Uh, sound will help your editorial. If your ambiences will smooth out edits. Sound effects that go over edits or before them will help will help smooth it, so your your film feels better paced uh, through the sound. Dialogue being king, if it's nice and clear and sits steady in your mix, then um, people if they chase the volume up and down, they're out. Yeah, yeah, that's true. And these are things that cost people their their festival wins and and cost people their their distribution, and they just don't know it. Yeah. And so what sort of festivals are you kind of talking at? Is it just film festivals and they have like a, a section just for uh, just technicians talking about the craft? or? Uh, yeah, it depends a little bit. Um, one of my favorites for, for the, the faith and family is the Christian Worldview Film Festival in um, San Antonio, Texas. It's about right. a couple months now, too. I think it's in March. Because they have... Um, keynote kind of things that are applicable to everybody, but then the people are going to be doing little workshops, do a one-minute song and dance to kind of convince the audience to come, 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 listen to sound. You don't need to listen to another thing about acting. You've been doing right. that. <laughs> yeah, to me. Um, and then they break up, and there's there's a group of of these little workshops. So you only get people who are interested in what you're talking about. Right. Well, that, that always helps as well. And it's a lovely, absolutely lovely format. But also, it's sometimes it's just one stage that rotates people through, and that's a lecture kind of a thing. Um, right. San Antonio will unpack a project, and I'll pull out Isotope and clean something and show people what can and can't be cleaned and how far you should take it before you pass it off to to uh, re-recording um so at any place i can drive to that'll that'll pay my stay i'll go yeah fantastic no it'd be something i'd be really interested in again just 
just for talking to people like yourself. <laughs> so I need to try and do that this year as well, I think, and try and go to more festivals. Because the only, the only things at the moment that have, the only kind of, the kind of main, I guess, gatherings that they kind of are that are on a, I guess, a, a public kind of platform or a bigger platform that also involve uh, not just sound people, but also uh, filmmakers and camera people. They're just the, the kind of gear shows, but I, I find that again, they only have maybe like one or two people just telling you how to mount a mic on a camera so you don't get a terrible reference track as opposed to a unusable reference track. <laughs> and it's a bit kind of... Please depressing. just give me a reference track. Yeah, exactly. Don't throw it away in editorial. <laughs> yeah. And just even, yeah. No, that's, that's cool. And I'm trying to think. So, so what are you doing first? What's your rough order? Because you're so it's you're doing your spotting session first, right? In terms of are you are you seeing stuff? Are, are you getting on projects kind of when they're still in editorial and you still have a bit of time to play around? Well, usually yes, just toward the very tail end of editorial, okay. um, or the oh no the place is burning down we need somebody right now those are the two <laughs> places that i get brought on um spotting is a really good idea to do really early on i've actually discovered i like to do my dialogue edit before spotting ah okay because at that point i can bring to the table immediately here's here's difficult places when we start talking about music, I know is, is this going to be big bombastic music that's going to cover up this subpar um, audio or or do we need to call it in ADR? And I'm very then intimate with the film and and can converse much more intelligently with the with the director about his vision for the movie. So that's actually I do it I'd like to do it in a little different order. Yeah, no, Again, that's really I'm, interesting. I'm a one or three man shop. I'm not. I don't have a whole army that I'm trying to organize. Yeah, yeah. I guess yeah. Trying to get on the same plane as the uh, the director is. You've got to do that as I guess as fast and as quickly as possible, just so you can. Uh, yeah, just try and. I guess not just guess them, but kind of build on whatever they're saying. So if they say right. well, this is their baby, yeah. and right. and it needs clothes that they like, and they've also been eating and sleeping and dreaming this for years <laughs> yeah and i'm supposed to come in and and get it very quickly yeah so you got to sit down and talk for more than two hours you can't just watch the movie together you got to take it take a good day all right all right Days. And do you have do you have a kind of um, I guess advice on kind of I guess set questions that can or not set questions but kind of questions that are that are not so open that it doesn't really give you anything but not so closed that it it doesn't become a yes or a no in terms of of what you need to understand of of the story to help you with the sound design. I like to ask. I like to tell the director that sound is a character just off screen right what are they doing is is sound supposed to make this scene claustrophobic that's kind of you know i try to get them thinking along those lines but if this guy is breaking up with his girlfriend and he comes back home to his apartment and it's the first time we see his apartment well is there a party going on right above right yeah um, um, is is there sirens? Is 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 this is the world encroaching upon him just off screen, way over here, or yeah. is is it silent? Is his world very quiet, and we just hear the hum of the air conditioner because he is so totally alone? Um, so, if sound is a character just off screen, what are they doing, and what what tension, uh, or what are they revealing? Is something that I like to talk through. Um, yeah, and I guess uh, pacing is another big thing as well uh, that we've kind of touched on as as well. And is there? 
are you because uh, an editorial will obviously have a sense of pace but is there i guess there's moments when you're when you're saying you can make this even slower or you can make this seem even quicker because i guess it's all at the end of the day trying to just have that ongoing like dynamic kind of push and pull narrative of like drawing you in and uh, and and putting stuff back at you right is there any is there anything in trying to understand just pacing other than just kind of like watching watching the film well it's much more difficult in animations because there's nothing to gear off of right okay yeah live action stuff editorial has so much sway and they almost never bring in sound before they're done um yeah. to to say hey give me a give me a little bit of a breath here um but i think that's one of the things that separates a great editor and a great director from the next tier down mm. is to, to think about the breathing again if it's a sound if it's a guy off screen what's he doing at this moment do we need to give him a breath of a moment to do that? Mm. Um, so I, I, I don't have, unfortunately, a lot of a lot of control over over it. But you can ramp up or or pull back. Like a drummer, you, you'll have the same tempo, but is is his hi hat coming ahead of the beat or is he laying really back on the beat? Mm. It's the same tempo. But is does it make this motion or this motion? And that's the control that that I do have. And on a good project, you can you can play with it. Nice, nice. And so once you've done, um, so you've done your dialogue edit, and then you've done your spotting as well. And I guess that uh, just helps you in terms of again whether stuff whether the in terms of the dialogue that's been recorded needs to be re-recorded in ADR. Right. Um, do you do you do any ADR yourself, or do you, are you doing? Are you? Um, is there another member of your team that you that you kind of hire in for that? The hardest part about ADR is getting the actors. In ah, okay. Yeah, and getting course, the actors yeah. comfortable. And currently, I'm halfway between Atlanta and Nashville, so we could bring somebody up here. Usually, though, everybody feels better if I go someplace else. Right. Yeah. Okay. Uh, you've got to do your due diligence beforehand and make sure you're dealing with a fully or a an ADR studio, competent studio, not just somebody that can get a screen into a recording room. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, or you're going to be stuck with everything sounding like it. Uh, it's it's in a really nice music room nice and reverberant and warm and rich but not outside or whatever sound we're trying to go for and um oh i do ask the the talent if they have ever played an instrument ah, okay look because i have discovered if they have played an instrument not singing hmm. i don't know why singing doesn't count but okay. drums trumpet bass anything if you've played an instrument you are going to adr faster than someone who is not and right. hmm. best i, I can guess is we spend musicians spend all their time copycatting each other yeah 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 here's a lick oh yeah i can play that lick here's another lick i can play that lick and and adjusting tone so it's rhythm and tone, and you're used to listening to it um, and mimicking it. So you can get in the studio, you hear the you hear the lick a couple times, and blah, blah, out comes a lick. Um, I don't know. Other yeah. actors really need to get in their head and get back in the scene. And sometimes, like, I don't care. This was brilliant. I, it was great. It's just you know the. Location guy was off axis, the jerk, you know? Yeah. <laughs> so now we got to re record it. No. I have fun enough. Yeah. It's, yeah, I'm just trying to think of all the times that I've tried to, yeah, just trying to 
understand people and get people back in that space because again if it's especially if it's a really really emotional scene and then they're sitting there in the warm studio with the starbucks and the donut it's it's hard to get them <laughs> some of them <laughs> it drags back into the film and it just doesn't quite sit right as well um, yeah, I, I guess i guess sometimes i guess worse comes to the worst you always have the adr as a kind of backup and you kind of go with maybe the less uh painful yeah the less painful version of the actual original performance and you try and um try and work magic in other ways i guess mm -hmm. but uh yeah no it's, it's magic what people do in there and and loop groups as well i haven't had any experience of loop groups um but just talking to other people it, it sounds like it's a, a fascinating thing to do in terms of just have like seven people just suddenly turn into like a shopping mall or <laughs> or like a, a group of <laughs> police guys uh what's your what's your experience with loop groups there's um i work with studio in california when i need loop group done um they just they're they're stand-up comedians these guys and girls they because they they have to watch a scene and okay i'm a cop now and then the next thing oh you be the bum and you be <laughs> the, the couple that are walking in the background um and and they know all sorts of tricks uh walking past the microphone to give a sense of motion um but you cue all those and tell them what you want free and clear. Tell them what you want just in the hubbub um, and let them go at it. And then, then rein them in when they get nuts and crazy and start. <laughs> yeah, but you, you saw the, uh, you just saw Beyond the Mask? Yeah, yeah. Yep. One of the larger movies I've worked on. There's a, a pub scene. Yeah. It goes into this pub. And he's going to decide if he's going to be uh, for the crown or for the colonies. And <laughs> there's this guy in the background who just stomps on the table. There's no reference. I have no idea what this guy says. So we get in the loop group. And I said, I need, I need something for that guy. And these guys lip read all the time. So he says, she was standing on it. Like, okay, go with that. So it's this <laughs> So she was standing on it, you know, like that was the punchline of some big joke. And then we repeated it three other times in the movie. Right. You never know what the joke is. Yeah. Uh, to the ball scene when, when Will Reynolds walking by somebody, if you know where to listen, you can hear somebody say, but she was standing on it. <laughs> <laughs> Man, I'll, I'm going to rewatch it. <laughs> listen. Uh, yeah, That's they so really. Cool. I, when I gave them the temp dub for Beyond the Mask, when we we took it to uh, to Juniper Post for re-recording, um, those jokes were a lot hotter in the mix because I thought they were they were absolutely hysterical. <laughs> yeah, but I like I like that sort of stuff, um, but they got they got turned way down. <laughs> no. well, yeah, it's all about that. Just. It's crazy just the amount of layer of detail that it just adds in terms of just like a person sitting in a bar, it's suddenly a, a happy one or a bad one. And then obviously just the change in that background as well, like when he's like, um, are you for the are you for the, the king or the crown? And then people are like, God save the queen, God save the king. And yeah. <laughs> stuff like that. I really love that. Rabble rouser. Yeah, yeah. Cool, yeah. And everyone brilliant. just changes. I love those guys. There's there's some of my there's some of my favorite people in the world. And so are you just giving them, so you, you obviously give them um, uh, the film and what you've, is it everything that you've done so far? Or are you just giving them atmospheres? Are you giving them like different mixes or do you just give them the full film and then they just kind of, and your notes, and then they just kind of uh, just give you like loads of stuff? Um, great question. I give them as clean of something as I can. So... I, I try to deliver whatever the best version I can at the moment. So they're not fighting um, any ugliness. Um, right. If it gets really bad, they just don't they wear headphones. Right. Um, but if they're trying to nuance a scene, it's really good to have an atmosphere in and the dialogue that's there is clean. So they kind of know the bar that you were talking about yeah. being already having the atmosphere under it. Um, they can get a really good sense of space that they're trying to to inhabit 
Mm-hmm. How, how, how boisterous are they? How big are they? Um, so that helps. But then you queue you everything. And, and most of the people I'm working with are in Pro Tools. So I'll set up a separate Pro Tools session and I'll go through and I'll put a marker in for um, everything that I want. Uh, sometimes I give two sessions, one that's, that's all the stuff and then another one that's the free and clears. But more, most of the time, it's a single session. Everything I want has a, a marker in it. And then I export that marker for whoever's overseeing the loop group so they can tick off their list and they just, they just go on through and crank it out. You're always dealing with time and money. So yeah. you get five people into a, into a loop group, which would be a smallish loop group, it's five to eight mm. is the usual number I've been working with. Um, I'm not doing Ben Hur, so I, you know, the Prince of Egypt or something like that, where you need a mass crowd. But you're paying these guys, and they may be union. You may be paying them lots of money. Uh, you're paying your mixer to to cue things up and get the beeps in place. You're paying the um, the person who's overseeing the loop group, whoever, yeah. it is, and that person's a getting double the wage that that their best paid looper is getting paid and then you're paying hundreds of dollars an hour for the room that yeah of so course, of course. it's you know you, you pay me well and then you pay them well times times 10 and so anything i can do to make their jobs easier and faster is better for the production and yeah, I will yeah. get more good stuff out of um, out of them um, than I would if I just said, you know, "Go for it." Yeah, of course, of course. And in terms of, um, I guess, uh, just the managing because you're usually heading up stuff. I mean, this is um, what I what I end up doing when I'm kind of, I guess. I go on usually as more of a, a like sound supervisor, just because again, being on location, you know the project and everything else, and then um, just hiring hiring people that are like specialized in like dialogue editing or better than I can do, for instance. Um, and so, are you, are you given just like a set amount? Are you like budgeting yourself for your your department essentially? There's two ways people tend to approach budget from the company side. Mm. One is they call and say, how much do you charge? Yeah. And that's like calling a builder and saying, how much does it cost to make a, build a house? Um, well, I can get you a double wide trailer, you know, or <laughs> I can, um, what do you need? And, or the people who call up and say, I've got this budget and this kind of a movie how much what what can we do i much prefer to work with those guys yeah 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 definitely the people who ask you how much you charge a good portion of them are going to try to nickel and dime you all the way down to the end and ask for one more uh temp dub don't or, or they give you another editorial edit and don't realize that that's 10 hours of work to conform yeah and then the rest obviously <laughs> No, yeah. I've been there, been there as well. So it, it's usually though I tend to settle on a package, all-in package price, with clauses for what would cause us to go over that. Right. Yeah. Of course. Um, so like a complete recut. <laughs> for yes. <instance>. Yes. <laughs> I. We don't have time to start before you get a locked picture, uh, unless you're going to pay me these days of conforming yeah. um, and then I try to budget that out and right, yeah. if I've got the budget oh man I love hiring people that just do what they do and if we've got the budget as much as as re-recording mixer is like the equivalent of a rock star for us you know? yeah <laughs> they've got the great ears and as much as I would I love having that title there is something to taking this piece of work 
to a completely fresh set of ears. Yeah. yeah. And getting into a larger, into a larger, um, room, um, on a proper, proper projection, theatricals, speakers and such, and working through it again. I, I hear stuff that I've never heard before. Mm. Yeah, I suppose just like the director has again heard all the rushes in editorial and they think that they um that the that there's been no lip smacks, for instance, or there's been no <laughs> right, <laughs> no right. burping there's, or no ridiculous speakers and they're this big, you know. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Or their um yeah, their beats headphones. <laughs> oh, hey. You have beats headphones? <laughs> no, I don't oh, know. Cool. <laughs> Sarcasm, just just they're in case. wireless. They're wireless. <laughs> yeah, it, it, I love that 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 final interaction with with getting somebody else in the room, and I live for the Frankenstein moment when the scene comes. It's like all the pieces are assembled on the table. I've got a heart over here and a liver over here and a, and a hand flopping over, and sound kind of stitches these things together, and if. If you do it right, suddenly the thing jumps up and 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 the scene lives, and and ambles off on its own. That's that's my favorite moment, and it tends to happen really late in the project, well <laughs> after the honeymoon is worn off. Uh. <laughs> it's good. It's good. Yeah, because I yeah no I like because I I work with the um yeah re-recording mixer as well to. And it is really interesting just, again, I think it's just sitting in the different spaces as well, because a lot of the times, obviously, I'm I'm working like just uh, straight out of the box and you're just working at home and it's not it's not ideal. Um, but it obviously, in terms of placing things and, and getting the right mix of things, it's fine. Um, but just that final kind of, I guess, finessing and um, just the, yeah, the mixing <laughs> just really, really brings it brings it out as well and especially when you can just go through and you do all your automation of um especially just bring bringing up kind of sound designs bringing up uh, the sound effects as well and then just kind of sprinkling the music on top no it's really really cool um i'm trying to think back ah with um because you mentioned about space like the loop group understanding the space as well and it's it's really interesting just even thinking of like beyond the Beyond the mask, um, because there there are not big establishing shots of space inside, or not that many. There's there's things of like ballroom and things like that. Um, yeah. But are they? Is that coming into play in terms of what you're doing with your sound design and your sound effects? Are you trying to understand how big each room is in terms of um, being able to fill it with different things. I probably phrased that really badly. No, I think I understand what you're saying. Yeah. Um, sound can be a set extension. You know, in, in the visual world, they chop off things and add, they replace the sky or they, they'll they extend the street way down. Um, and sound can do the equivalent of hmm. that. Beyond the Mask was particularly challenge um, because it was a period piece. Yeah. And 1776 is not nearly as noisy as <laughs> 2015 or 16. So there's less to play with. Right. And yeah, of course. Of course. Mm -hmm. So you really get to, I had to pull harder. My, my library had a very narrow number of, of ambiences to use and you need, at least three of them if you're doing surround and and so you start layering things and then you have to go record stuff to get creative in the middle of the night um or scouring sound libraries and buying things uh to fill mm. it out to try to make the space right and contemporary things are easier yeah but you do try to look so that the reverb works in the room, um, so that the sense of life off screen filters into the room properly. That is really, really tough. Mm -hmm. No, yeah, because I was wondering. Uh, yeah, because I completely forgot that. Obviously, being period drama, that 
because yeah, there's not much that's going to be going on outside apart from maybe farmyard animals or just <laughs> yeah. So how wind. many moves can you have, right? Yeah, the wind, the weather. Um, but you had a good. There was a good variety of scenes as well, especially with like the uh, the mad laboratory, like under the windmill at the end, oh, for instance. No. That was, I suppose, then you can go to town on that in terms of just them creating electricity and, and bombs. That and was fun. I liked it. <laughs> <laughs> the evil oh, way it, you know, most of what you and I do is not laboratories buried under the water with sparks. It's more um, common. You know, it's people talking to each other and Sometimes they're angry and sometimes they're sad. <laughs> yeah. Basically, talking to each other, getting in and out of taxi cabs. So, man, I am currently really gunning for any project that's going to have something beyond that. And it's tricky on in the in the lower budget world. Beyond the mask, they they just stretched their production dollar massive, yeah. stretched their production dollars and and did elevate CD elevators and and horse chases and rooftop runs and all sorts of craziness. Um, I'm going to be working on another movie that's that'll be a race car movie. So I'm wow. I'm pretty stoked about about that. Uh, they say the location guy did a day with the car, and uh, I'm hoping he got useful gravel, you know, peel outs and because it's dirt it's dirt racing. Or, Give me some muffler engine revs and yeah. Also, hope Let's they did juice. well because <laughs> yeah. I don't have a stock car in my backyard to go and record. No, that'd be fantastic. No, and I guess uh, even with um, something like race cars as well, I guess another challenge is trying again. I guess it gets back to kind of the dynamics and just trying to keep things keep things fresh, as it were. Or you don't want to just become so um i guess or do you maybe like you don't want i was just thinking about whether people want to get so engrossed in the world that they just accept the world and i guess they kind of do but i guess you have to keep adding little little flavors here and there to try and um just keep i don't know keep them keep them entertained or engaged engaged is the word isn't it um but i guess that happens in editorial as well so because going from like bar scenes to like outside to inside. Um, sorry, I'm just thinking well, myself. It, it editorial has, you know, massive thing. We talked about that, but mm. is as soon as you hear the same sound more multiple times, there's this sub part of your brain that's been listening since before you were born to the world and realizing that it's not no two things are exactly the same. So it's footsteps. You cut them off the CD, and it's tick 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 tick, tick and eventually the audience goes, "Stop it!" <laughs> um, so you're, the car goes by. Vroom, next 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 car. Vroom, next car. Vroom, <laughs> you're like boring, boring. Um, and even though that is real, I, I've been to the Indianapolis 500. Motor right. speed, yeah, I, I've I've seen them, and after a while, it's just <laughs> <laughs> repeatedly. They just go around in a circle. Um, so, as a filmmaker, how do you keep that interesting? And hopefully, editorial's done a good job of giving me different pieces of the car. And you know, stock cars have this shell that that can vibrate. So. No great shot is down where you can see the the part of the car going like this and the tire, you know, the ground's going flying by. So then I can add from this really like low thumpy rumble, you know, sound of the the flapping of the car, and it gives it gives grit and and life to that scene. Um, and it, and I like to have the hero car sound different than the other cars so that it's just oh. just a little bit he has a little different tune up um or in beyond the mask john reese davies plays the bad guy charles kemp he has uh leather undergarments no matter what he's wearing he creaks 
just right. a little bit. Um, and that feeds a subconscious part of our brain that this guy isn't on the level. <laughs> yeah, he's creaking. <laughs> creaking. Yeah. He's, and and nobody's going to listen to the movie and say, hey, that guy's creaking. <laughs> it, it's that undercoat color that, that's added that, that does keep it, it fresh and interesting. And you have to have it. Um, or the audience gets bored and then mm. they start realizing this is a movie. This isn't real. And then they overanalyze everything and, and the whole story unravels. Mm. No, that's really interesting. Just to, yeah, just even just hearing about the undergarments and yeah, having that as another detail as well. Cause again, I'm always thinking kind of big picture, but I guess in terms of things like Foley, um, which I guess it, you must have had to do quite a bit of Foley for that film as well, although it did sound really clean, obviously. It doesn't sound like it's in 2015, even when you're outside, and I'm sure there was lots of planes and everything else, <laughs> as there um, is in London, definitely. Was there there was stuff to be cleaned up, um, but, you know, the my team, we are ninjas. You should see our effects. You should know that we were there because, like, the king is dead. Mm. Somebody cut his head off. There was a ninja here, but you should never actually see us. That's that's my goal to to have a seamless seamless picture when you're done. Yeah, and um, before I forget about um, what you like to get from location sound okay. and how we try and link, because um, I guess you have another filter going through. Because if you're joining an editorial, then um, it's it's probably been a while since the sound mixer was obviously there x y and z so but what 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 are the ideals in terms of just getting off to a really good start with the material that you're given how about hiring somebody who knows what they're doing well that yeah let's take that as a given hopefully that, okay, that's a given <laughs> because you're going to pay somebody and you can pay somebody like matt um and then pay me less money and i'll actually be happier because <laughs> you'll have less to do right <laughs> So, um, hire a great guy. Uh, be sure that that they have the gear that's going to do justice to your project. Um, that they have monitoring systems so they know when something's off. Um, I got an entire project. It was a one point three million dollar movie. They had an eight eight hundred and fifty thousand dollar U.S. production budget. Right. Um. And the location guy didn't understand noise floor. And so the labs, uh, and, and his boom operator was was no good. So nice. things would swing in the middle of, of lines oh. and render the whole line useless. I'd rather be a little off axis the entire time than yeah. in the middle. Um, but so, so we had to use labs. The boom was, was just done. Um, and then the labs were set for yelling. So when they got quiet and intimate, it was just like noise floor. You couldn't hear it. Yeah. <clears throat> so budget doesn't mean that doesn't doesn't necessarily mean that I'm gonna that it's gonna be good. Um, right. But it, assuming the guy is competent, yeah, um, I like to get notes. So that for, one of the most important things, what's on channel one, two, three, four, five? Please right. write that down. It, cool. your, your metadata may or may not make it through editorial. Yeah. To me. And if it doesn't, then I have to audition however many tracks and try to figure out whose lab am I listening to or is this the boom? Because this person seemed to move their boom around. <laughs> I don't know why. Uh, <laughs> I much prefer, I don't care how you do it. Boom, hero, hero, alternate, alternate, alternate. But, or the other way around, boom's always on eight. I don't care, but consistency is ideal. Um, telling me what things are is an absolute must. Um, write it down. It's going to change so many hands. Editorial can, can totally mess things up, and we have to manually sync or whatever. And... And I need to know what stuff is. Um, naming structure that makes sense. There's lots of ways to digest that. 
the modern digital ones, you can program scene and take right in the name. That's beautiful. Yeah. Uh, not required. Time time works just fine. Um, but somehow, because what happens is I'll get in, I'll pull up a scene, and the second half of this sentence isn't very good for whatever reason. Somebody yeah. off dropped a wrench, whatever reason. And my first reach is for an alt before I reach for isotope to try to clean the thing. Yeah. Um, so I can pull it up and if it's by time and my, my list shows me that scene 14, uh, B has the following has six takes to it. Then I can go and I can find the file name and then the other six takes are sitting right next to it as the auditions go really fast. Um, so naming is, is, is important. Uh, some sort of structure that makes sense to the world is important. I don't need to write down airplane on take for me. If the editor, if your editor wants to know, then make those kind of notes, but I'm going to notice an airplane coming over at, at 500 feet. Um, <laughs> not going to be a problem, but if there's something particularly good, write okay. that. Okay. Ah, uh, okay. Okay. That's interesting. Yeah. If you just, if you thought something was really tasty, make a little note. Um, I love to get wild takes on anything that, that you think might be, you couldn't get a boom in um, to the shot. Pull them over while they're changing scenes, when the scene is fresh in their brain, and, and have them run it twice and just mark those wild, wild. Um, those can be absolutely brilliant because sometimes the actor will relax a little bit because they're so tense because the camera is like completely right there um so sometimes they'll relax and give you just a really wonderful um take but i need to write it down or it's useless I, i'll never find it because i'm not gonna go looking unless it says oh hey cool i've got a, a wild take for this scene um I think those are the big things I like to get from location. Um, and I really like it when editorial uses pluralize or whatever they're going to do before they edit the movie. Um, right. So I'm not trying to hunt down and rebuild something. Right, right. I tell editorial, if you don't think you want it, put it on a mute track. Yeah, yeah, of course. It away. And with them, um, are they giving you um, like full handles? Are they giving you what are they giving you in terms of what they've provided in terms of a, a template session? Um, I really need handles. You mentioned that, um, mm. but are they giving you like the full so it extends to the full file? Or because I'm I'm just wondering with stuff like Beyond the Mask, obviously, if you have so many different people and so many different layers, does your your session probably becomes okay. even like a terabyte, ter several terabytes maybe? <laughs> that, yeah. that sound sound isn't that big, um, but if it doesn't have handles, I'll reject it, mm. send it back, and have them re-export it again. Um, it's just impossible to hard cut. It makes sense to the editor. They're used to it, but I yeah, need, yeah. I need those edges. Um, but are you, are you asking for like the whole file as in the like unlimited handles as it were? So you could I'm, like, for instance, stretch all the way back to where it says like, take one, take one. Not Clap. in the session in the A for okay. OMF. Uh, give yeah. me five seconds, five uh, seconds. Okay. Yeah. Five second handles. But then deliver everything. Yeah. Okay. With all the rushes. Yeah. With with all of it, and don't rename the audio for me. If the location guy named it, leave it. Um, some editorial guys think they're being really helpful by renaming a date based naming system to scene and take. Um, oh, yeah. Now I can't. Now I have to go to the paper logs and see what you were shooting at. Uh, what time you were shooting that scene. 
and sometimes they'll go back and shoot the same scene later. And, yeah, of course. And it, but it'd be a different day, but it might be the same time, right? As right. Well, that must, yeah. So my all my all my raw files are are by time. Um, so please, editorial, don't rename files, I, even if you're OCD about it. <laughs> yeah. I want to be able to read the file name, find it in my folder, check my list, see I've got six takes, check those six takes, and bring it in. Because um, then I'll have unlimited handles, but kind of yep, yep. offline, so to speak. Yep. Yep. Um, room tones, uh, another location thing. Yep. The worse the location is, the more I want room tones. Okay. So if it's an ugly location, give me lots of time so that I can find some ugliness to to merge the ugly of the shoot. Does that make yeah. sense? Yeah, yeah. Nice. Well, this is a good checklist so far. I'm doing very well. Although I will keep in <laughs> mind the... Um, <laughs> the the good points as well because that's yeah that's quite an interesting point um over in the uk we just do like scene slate and take so i just name everything like five dash one oh that's T great to one or something um but yeah trying to get editorial to then somehow they always seem to manage to lose that data somehow which i still need to figure out so i can explain to half of them well this is the little button that's hidden in the menu in the menu, in the other menu, <laughs> that preserves right. preserves data. Um, and what are you using for reconforming as well? Because I don't, um, I don't have any reconforming software. I don't think at the moment. There is a really cool piece of software by some Aussies um, called conformalizer or something like that <laughs> original you, original. you have one. if big if you have a properly exported edl from the version you're working on yeah. and then a properly exported edl of the new version yeah then if it has to be the exact version right <laughs> yeah <laughs> that's the, the problem i've had version, in the past yeah <laughs> then, then it will it will conform um it does a great job most of the time, I work off a copy of the session. I have my current video, and I use Pro Tools. So yep. um, in HD, you can have multiple tracks of video. Yeah, yeah. And so I layer my current video, and I, I lock everything together, expand it all so I see all the playlists, and then put the new video up top and start scanning for differences. Um, or they'll tell me I made edits here, here, here. That's brilliant. Yeah. But you don't often get that. Um, so you scan for differences. You find it. You make a cut. You slide everything down. You make a cut and trim. Make a cut. Set that whole scene at the end. Move it down. Um, that's why it's a a really long day. Yeah. For somebody to conform. And and the nip and tucks are the worst. Or they'll just tighten and and I, anything that serves a movie, it's my job to facilitate that. So mm -hmm. when an editor goes and they tighten the film and they they just and do all these little things so that the scene that was dragging now gets up and out of the way, um, I'm all for it. But those little nip and tucks will just eat your lunch. <laughs> yeah. Already done those steps, and now the foot. Oh man! <laughs> no, that's very true. Yeah, that's kind of what I'm going through at the moment with uh, with another project that I'm on. <laughs> but uh, it's all a all a learning experience, you know. It's good. <laughs> I wish I could tell you there's an easy push this button, but yeah, no, that's the trick. But you know, you yeah. Once you've been through it once, hopefully that you can at least explain it to other people, and then <laughs> it never happens again. Oh, fan fantastic! Well, it's been over an hour, and so oh. I'm I'm trying to wow. yeah. These things do fly by, don't they? It's but I've uh, I've tried to promise myself that instead of uh, going on for hours and hours, I think with Simon Hayes I did two hours and fifteen in one go, which was um, a bit much for many people um, just to sit to sit through. Um, but um, so I yeah so I'll kind of wrap it up. But the the idea as well is to try and get people back uh, here, there, and everywhere to just 
chat about stuff and and just have that kind of ongoing dialogue about mm -hmm. stuff as well because I guess this can uh, just help serve if things have changed for instance <laughs> in terms of um, different software or different things that people are using um, obviously the fundamentals kind of stay the same but it's uh, it's always interesting how they're how they're applied and where they're applied so so yeah so I guess um, yeah I'll wrap it up and then uh, we can just have a little uh, chat offline as well but this is kind Wonderful. of the official end to the uh, sound chat when the real of, secrets will come out uh, exactly <laughs> then all the all the f-bombs all the swearing and everything else. oh okay, and the okay alcohol no no i see i see <laughs> no no so um i just want to say thank you to everyone uh that's been watching um and we're up to the big 4-0 which is very cool um i'm going to try and get to like 50 or 60 i think this year i think i can manage to cram in 20 um by the end of 2016 so that should bring us up to a nice round, uh, probably 40, 50 hours of interviews, which I think is quite impressive. Um, but I will uh, I will say goodbye, and I will leave you, Nathan, to say the final goodbye. And I guess um, if there's any kind of bits of it, um, yeah, I'm trying to think of it, a good kind of final bit in terms of uh, advice for people, not necessarily just straight starting out, but maybe people that have been in a couple of years. Wait, I need to think about this first. I can't just throw this on you. Um, well, I think I know exactly what I'd like to say to that. Well, um, fantastic. Then I will leave it with you um, to say the final goodbye as well. Thank so you. Over to you. My grandfather comes to the age of working for a company and getting a golden watch at the end of your years of service. And it freaks him out that I work in an industry where I'm not necessarily sure what I'm going to be doing next month. Um, so where is the stability in what we do? And it is in our network. This is part of why I really love this uh, sound rolling. The, the building of network that, that Matt's working here is vital for what we do. It is our only security. And networking is not a list of people you know any more than it's a list of banks in town. Look, I know every bank in town. Yes, and you have no money in any of them. So if you're thinking a networking is passing business cards around, um, that's, it's not, it's, that's a Rolodex, not a network. Networking is getting to meet people. You put a deposit in, you, you spend a little bit of time chatting with them. You have lunch, have a drink, whatever you do to make a personal connection. Now you've opened an account. Then you do work for them. You come in in the clutch. Um, you're not the last guy across the finish line. Uh, you bail them out when there's a problem. And when you make a mistake, you own up to it and try to make it right. That is a major deposit into their account. So the next time they're looking for work, they think, ah, that guy pulled my tail feathers out of a fire. I'm going to hire them again. And besides, they're a hoot. I like to have them around. Um, so that is... The, the security that we have. It's in people, it's in relationships, gear changes. Um, you don't have to work from a massive studio anymore. All of these things are, are just daily changing, but relationships with people are really the backbone of, of our industry. So thank you, Matt, for, for sound rolling and for sound chats and for all that you do. Uh, I really appreciate it and you're my hero. <laughs> Thank you very much, and that is a, a brilliant way to end. Um, so, see you all for Sound Chat 41. <laughs>